one describes such a day. The wrongdoing of all humanity putting to an end an innocent man, the Son of God. This is the story of Jesus' death by way of the cross, all in one moment bringing death to the bright light of our future. He never stopped loving us, and yet this is the incredible part of it. Our sin stopped his heart. Our sin drove the nails firmly in the hands of God. All along, these were the plans. We told ourselves that we were in control, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. The brutal beating, the inhuman flogging, the naked humiliation. Evan watched and saw it all. Our rebellion, our guilt, our shame, erasing the very notion of reconciling us with God. Our sin and our debt overcoming Jesus. Here is our key, obliterating. The enemy laughing, his plan is unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of freedom rising. Now God's people are utterly broken. Behold the chains of mortality. Yes, this is what is true. We heard the stories of old. The lost are found, the blind can see, the weak are made strong. But now, we are witnesses to this reality. God is dead. We'd almost believe that there is a way of redemption. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a peace beyond understanding. Now we know better. For us, we can say that God is encapsulated in this one realization. The single great sacrifice in human history is finished. How clearly we can see it. So what's so good about Good Friday? Just one thing. That the blood of Jesus can reverse the curse of sin and raise the dead to life. How clearly we can see it is finished. The single great sacrifice in human history encapsulated in this one realization. We can say that God is for us. Now we know that there is a peace beyond understanding. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a way of redemption. We almost believe God is dead, but now we are witnesses to this reality. The weak are made strong. The blind can see. The lost are found. We heard the stories of old. Yes, this is what is
compassion of our Lord. So let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God bless our time together. Jesus Christ died so that he could take your sins with him to the grave. Your sins died with Jesus and are never to be remembered again. Therefore be assured that as you believe, you are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Anna sent him still bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself. So they asked him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. charge against him. 
If it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover, you want me to release the king of the Jews? And shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. That's far reading. <laughs> Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. Thus far, we read.
Elias. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. You refuse to speak to me, Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gavita. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, Take him away! Take him away! Crucify him! Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Sorry. to the Lord. In the words of Isaiah the prophet, O Lord Jesus Christ, surely you have borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem you stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Lord, you were wounded for our transgressions, you were crushed for our iniquities. Upon you was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with your stripes we are healed. The Lord, we ask that you would continue to be your own sins, and be your own decisions, and be your own All we might achieve in my strength, we have turned every one to our own way, and the Lord has laid on you the iniquity of us all. You were oppressed, and you were afflicted, yet you opened not your mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before it shears is silent, so you opened not your mouth. By oppression and judgment you were taken away, and as for your generation, who considered that you were cut off out of the land of the living? stricken for the transgression of his people. Lord, we give you thanks for the hunting and comforting of your death, the sending of God, and for our redemption of all the sins. It made your grave with the wicked, with the rich man in your death, although you had done no violence, and there was no deceit in your mouth. Lord, he was honorable.
Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush you. He has put you to grief. When your soul made an offering for sin, he saw his offspring. He shall prolong your days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in your hand. Out of the anguish of your soul, you saw and was satisfied. By your knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, made many to be accounted righteous, and you bore their iniquities.
soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by what who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, They divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Thus far we read. Jesus at night. 
Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds, taking Jesus' body to have been wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This is the passion of our Lord. Be there. 
But the truth is, based on what Jesus had come to accomplish, to suffer and die for the sins of the whole world for all time, the entire world was there on Good Friday. You were there. And so was I. Now, we didn't come up with the charges that were used to convict Jesus. We didn't hand down the order to crucify Jesus. None of us wielded the hammer that drove the nails into his hands. But we were there because our sins were there. Jesus carried them there. On the cross, he bore the, the crushing burden of the sins of humanity. That means that our sin is the reason God's Son had to suffer and die. That means that you and I are no less guilty than all the people who were directly responsible for Jesus' death. Now, if you have a hard time accepting that, if you want to put that charge to the test, don't look around and compare yourself to the Roman soldiers, or the Jewish leaders, or the missing disciples. Look up at the cross. Look deep inside. Examine your heart. Compare yourself with Jesus. When the crowd shouted mockingly, save yourself and come down from the cross. That must have been tempting for Jesus to think about doing just that. If only for the shock value alone. A little tough love sometimes is the good thing. And yet Jesus doesn't utter even one word of blame toward anyone. Instead, he offered a prayer for their forgiveness. He prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. He was asking God to pardon the people who were putting him to death. And maybe there were people there that day who had been blinded to the significance of what was happening. You know, blinded to their, by their ambition. Blinded by their greed. Blinded by their jealousy of Jesus and the great following that he had. Maybe. But the man who had worked so many miracles during his ministry certainly didn't look like a miracle worker on Good Friday. He looked weak and helpless, stripped of his clothing, stripped of his dignity, bloody, beaten, unable to carry his cross, barely able to stand. Clearly in the eyes of his tormentors, Jesus had been defeated. The devil had won the day. Just like he wins every time we choose evil over the good. The times we know exactly what we're doing. And we do it anyway. Jesus often spoke of his relationship with his heavenly Father because according to his human nature, the Father had watched over him and seen that he was protected and nurtured since that very first Christmas morning. He kept him safe when Herod attempted to find him and, and kill him as a, as a young child in Bethlehem. Jesus' heavenly Father sent an angel to Joseph, his earthly father, warning him to flee to Egypt with his young family and stay there until the king died. And they did. And it saved their lives. There was the Heavenly Father's public recognition of his pleasure with his son at his baptism in the Jordan. According to his divine nature, they were co-equal along with the Holy Spirit. But Jesus the man spent many hours in prayer with his Father in heaven. It's a hard relationship to understand. But when Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Maybe we think we can relate. How many of those families whose lives were crushed by that supermarket shooter in Colorado, or the multiple shootings that have taken place even since then? How many of those families feel like they've been forsaken like that? Probably most of them. They feel like it. They haven't really experienced what Jesus did. See, when horrible things come into our lives, God has promised to walk through them with us, to be our strength to be our guide, to offer us comfort, and, and, and finally, because of Good Friday, his hope. That has to be the case for Jesus. The Father's abandonment of Jesus on the cross was, was not only real, but it was complete. He made his son to become sin for us, and the punishment for sin is death, physical and spiritual, that is eternal separation from God. And looking down at the steering crowds, remembering the betrayal of his friends, feeling the agonizing sting of the whip and, and the pouring out of his life blood. Jesus would have seen no evidence whatsoever that, that God would always be present with him and send his Holy Spirit to empower him in his ministry was still with him at all. On that dark day, God must have seemed very far away indeed. And now all the evil in the world is encircled him, ready to pounce. But Jesus never accuses God as the cause of his distress. You and I are naturals at hanging our victimhood on someone else. 
Even God, due to our frustration, somehow becomes the chief cause of all our pain, whether through direct action or indirect inaction. There's a pastor around who has had someone in his office asking, you know, why did God do this to me, or why did God allow this to happen to me? You ever thought that Jesus has every right to ask us, our sins being the cause of his suffering, why did you let this happen to me? You know, you and I in the passion of our Lord are inseparably tied. The Jesus who hangs on the cross not only cries out to God as he suffers in our place, but according to his divine nature, is God, the one who saves and the one who suffers. In Jesus, God has spoken to, to human suffering by participating in that suffering, taking it on, living, bearing all the blame and shame and pain of humanity in a moment of ultimate pain. It's a kind of paradox that in those times of suffering when, when God seems inexplicably absent, it's then that God is most intimately near. Because God has been where we are because of who we are. A sort of blessing in the sense that he's been there, but really more a, a curse because it was our sins that put him there. Jesus' death was painted for all our sins. Jesus, the Lamb of God, whose blood was shed uh, even in that moment, was taking away the sin of the world. His suffering was our hope. His death was death for our sins, but he endured it because he loves his creation, even as broken as we are. And because it's true God, he can look at this terrible day from the other side of the cross, the Easter side. Jesus' suffering on the cross ended in death, but it won't be the end of the story. Right? It ends with confidence that God will turn what looks like a great loss into the greatest victory ever. Victory over sin, death, and the devil. In the midst of the darkness that covered the whole world, the shining light of hope and help is just waiting to break through. If you know the end of the story, you know that forsakenness will turn to deliverance. In the midst of the greatest human suffering ever, even in our suffering, there's always, always Easter hope. It might be Friday, the eyes of faith can already see the dawn of Sunday morning. In many ways you were there. And in every way, Christ is still here. For you, for me, and for all of us. Amen. Now let's thank for you there.
Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. 